Hello and welcome to this very special uh, broadcast that you are seeing right now on uh, this platform. Uh, it is part of the IT for SMB campaign by the Economic Times in partnership with Lenovo. It's World MSME Day and uh, today is the best opportunity to talk about the Indian MSME landscape, the progress that they've made, the challenges that they continue to face and what best roadmap can be charted out for MSMEs for them to really achieve their potential. Now, uh, this year's theme at the uh, MSME Day in India is Future Ready MSMEs for India at 100. Uh, so how can MSMEs be prepared for their next journey, next growth journey in the next two decades ahead of India turning 100? So that's really the broad framework that the uh, that India is discussing the potential of MSMEs this year. And this special discussion that we're having today is within that same framework as well. I have with me two eminent speakers, Mr. Manpreet Dahuja and Mr. Amit Sachdev, who will talk about uh, what can be the uh, challenges that MSMEs face, what can be the best roadmap for them to be able to achieve that, and they will be in conversation with me. I am Gauri Devedi, Senior Editor with the Economic Times. Uh, before I first get in, Mr. Manpreet Ahuja, and then also later on, uh, open this up for the Q&A for the audiences that are um, joining in. I want to first uh, tell everybody who's joined in today that uh, why is this discussion so important? Why is it that we need to talk more about MSMEs? Why is it that we need to present a clearer growth framework for micro, small, and medium enterprises in India. First and foremost, of course, they hold the potential to transform the Indian economy, they foster job creation, and they promote equitable economic growth if they are given adequate support. And that support is on two fronts. One is the challenges they face around uh, people, training, credit, and secondly, around technology. On one end, technology can be a great equalizer. And on the other end, technology can also be the difference between the potential of a company to be reaching uh, into its uh, larger format and those that are not able to do so. And the Indian MSMEs realize this only too well. As per the latest economic review of the Department of Economic Affairs, it said that most Indian MSMEs continue to suffer from dwarfism, which is that they are not able to scale up. And technology is that biggest differentiator. 99% of MSMEs are micro units in India, while small enterprises are only 3.31 lakh and medium enterprises are just 5,000, making 0.5% and 0.01% share, respectively, in the overall Indian MSME landscape. Hence, this conversation becoming so important for all those who are tuning in right now and uh, to understand how is it that MSMEs can best utilize technology and scale up. Last, before I uh, bring in Mr. Ahuja and to talk about the specifics with regards to digital transformation of MSMEs, I want to quickly tell that MSMEs are about a third of India's GDP and employ over 110 million people, which is about 11 crores is what the employment currently exists for MSMEs in India and sky is the limit literally as far as the growth potential that MSMEs have. On that note, Mr. Manpreet Ahuja, I want to welcome you in. He is the Chief Digital Officer and part of the India Leadership Team at uh, PwC. And uh, he is uh, the one leading the next wave of digital transformation and driving the firm's bold ambition as far as disrupting its traditional business model is concerned. Manpreet, uh, welcome to this uh, very important discussion that we're having on a very important day. And uh, hope that uh, we will talk about uh, the digital transformation of MSMEs, where uh, we try and also educate and better inform 
MSMEs about why is it that they need to embrace technology, how efficiency can uh, increase manifold, how processes can become much easier and costs can come down if they are able to embrace technology at the right place at the right time. And uh, on that note, I hand this over to you to take this forward as we talk about how can MSMEs accelerate their growth and achieve their full potential. So thank you so much, Gauri, for setting the stage and pulling me in for this very, very interesting, important uh, topic close to heart. Uh, you know, uh, you know, whatever the $5 trillion ambition that we keep talking about, you know, that can't come to life in a country like India unless the MSMEs were to rise to the occasion. And it's not as though it's a dream we are thinking of. I mean, the MSMEs in their current avatar itself are a very significant part of the Indian economy. You know, whether you look at the number of people they employ, whether you look at the exports, whether you look at, uh, you know, just the whole manufacturing index. So there is a lot that the MSME does, but it gives me, gives me goosebumps when I think saying, if you really bring the power of digital to this thriving MSME ecosystem that the country represents, imagine what we'd be able to do uh, and, and how democratized that growth will be for a large country like India. So that's, uh, it's a great platform, great opportunity, Gauri, and would love to share as much of digital experience, uh, uh, you know, that I can and hopefully make it a reality for people listening into the conversation. So I think the first thing that comes to mind when you're an MSME is that how the hell can I compete with some of the large uh, companies, large whales that exist out there in the market. And we'd keep hearing different answers. One is to go back and say, let's coexist, let's partner, let's collaborate. I mean, all of that, but ground reality, we are in a competitive world. And, uh, you know, as they say, it, only the best people strive. you know, the, the best man survives, right? So how is it that I can, as a small company, uh, you know, compete with a large fish? And, and there are clearly three constraints that come to any small business leader's mind. You know, I am constrained for resources, I'm constrained for know-how, and I'm constrained for getting discovered by customers. I mean, those are three things that sort of differentiate between a large company and a small company. Uh, everybody knows levers, but I'm a new consumer brand. How will people get to know me uh, or, or discover me? And how do I get the resources? And how do I get the, uh, uh, the know-how and the capability? But as much as you kind of keep pondering on these three constraints and limitations that a small company leads has to deal with, you also kind of think that digital seems like that area that can help you cross the bridge on each one of those three. I mean, let's pick up an example, right? I mean, as much as we are constrained for resources, a tap on the cloud makes that resource available and an underlying layer of intelligence available at an affordable price point, which wasn't the possibility, you know, maybe a few decades ago. You know, unless you have the large, heavy capex available for doing the IT hardware investments, you couldn't have gotten started. Now that cloud ecosystem has created a whole gig ecosystem underlying it, where a lot of resources, uh, whether it's people, whether it's software, SaaS companies, available to companies that they can do a jump start on. So, so some of these constraints that we kind of constantly keep talking about in our mind are constraints that actually can get addressed if we were to open our, ourselves to embracing cloud, digital data, and kind of getting onto that journey. So that's that's important. And in fact, the more I think, the only right of win that exists today in the market is if you are able to solve these constraints and make them a competitive advantage. So I want to turn this on their head in saying, how can I as a small business be more nimble than a large company? How can I as a small company be a lot more resourceful in terms of how I solve for a customer problem? and be a lot more innovative in terms of how I hyper-personalize that experience back to customer for a customer to want to come to me rather than go to a large company. So the solution lies in the problem in itself and then hopefully bring some of these to life uh, in the examples that I share. Let me just quickly share my screen uh, so I can pull out my presentation. I hope you guys can see my slides. If not, please do shout. Uh, we are able I'm... to see Manpreet. Yeah, yes. yeah, perfect, perfect. Sounds good. Sounds good. Now, as I as I as I bring some stories to you around how at an affordable price point some of the digital solutions can be brought to life in driving growth on revenues or driving sort of cost benefits and cost advantages to the business. I think the bigger point that I want to make is right now, how do I first of all liberate my mind 
and 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 make myself open to all the innovation that's available on tap around me you know and and the visual here is just a quick example you know if you actually put a sealed object into water it actually bounces back it doesn't sort of embrace uh, uh, you know uh, the the things around itself versus if you were to open the lid and throw it down there is so much that's happening around us it's more a matter of being open to embracing all of that i mean you put that uh, 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 sort of uh, uh, thing in the water and there'll be water all inside it so there is a lot that's happening around us globally locally through the cloud companies but we got to keep ourselves open and be open around saying yes i can be your digital first i can be your digital native in doing this rather than going back and saying oh the big companies haven't done it why should i be doing it you know how do i make a start that's exactly the first shift that needs to happen in our uh, sort of mindset and the second is another interesting visual that i wanted to bring to the table is when you are when you are battling you know the war fields uh, you know the the context becomes very very important so step into the shoes of this grasshopper there is actually a flood in the river and this grasshopper seems to think i'm going to get drowned and this grasshopper is holding on to the strand of grass uh, you know trying to save survive manage you know seems like a reality sort of corporate environment right where we are fighting a battle every day and thinking there's this big tide that's coming in and take going to take us away there is generative ai coming in there's going to be billions of dollars being thrown in what will i do with generative ai oh my god let me hold on to my last grass but again it goes back to that culture mindset that i spoke of if this grasshopper were to let go that grass and go with the flow and go with that sort of tide in the in 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 the river for all you care this grasshopper will not drain the grasshopper is nimble enough agile enough to go with the flow and actually survive but it's the problems in our mind where we don't land up changing ourselves because we're used to a certain business model and we are too scared to taking the risk of embracing the technology embracing the digital embracing the new change that's happening around us not realizing that that is the change that which will create a competitive advantage for us so now with that uh, you know i want to bring in a few examples to the group here saying how is it that uh, you know we've had companies that have used technology digital to be able to create a competitive advantage for ourselves and the first and foremost if i were to pick up just two lenses right in business that we're all groomed with trained with is there are two things that we are here in the business for i mean we're driving revenues we are managing our costs and we got to create competitive advantage across both these levers for us to have a right to exist in the market so how can digital help me grow revenues how can i get discovered in this whole wide world of large brands that exist in the market and i might be a small company so today i think if you were to go back and we seen it with so many brands in their market in the market you know today if i am a small business building an online presence is easily doable and it's actually much more efficient spends on digital marketing today that one will have to do versus what large companies would have done through traditional media spends so how do i build my online presence how do i figure out my e-commerce integrations today there are e-commerce platforms that enable the msme businesses to 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 ride on those environments and be discovered and give a jump start to their business before they eventually get to a dth uh, uh, you know kind of a business model the whole crm ecosystem you know which is now reasonably mature that manages the customer data tracks interactions provide personalized experience now generative ai kind of gives it the next level of edge is a case for you to build brand loyalty despite being a smaller company despite not having hundreds and thousands of people in customer services like large companies could afford so it's a it's a it's a, it, the point i'm making is digital is going to become more and more a leveler rather than a divide between large companies and small companies uh, you know the data analytics and insights around customer customer behavior and helping sort of push and predict things down to their environments another quick example and and customer engagement and there are so many examples that come to our mind right like nike you know how on earth could nike have built a business model in 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 a in 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 a beauty cosmetic space which has got tons of marketing dollars thrown in global brands out there how can you even survive i mean the whole business model was a digital first business model and that's how they kind of created a a a business edge for themselves you know or a mama earth you know how could you even discover mama arts in this cluttered business uh, you know big market you created a niche for yourself you did niche target uh, target marketing you were sort of uh, 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 effective in terms of taking that product to the market in a in uh, to that niche audience and 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 for all you care you addressed the void that large companies were not able to address in the marketplace similarly on the cost side of the house you know digital 
and, uh, and, and underlying capabilities within digital allows you to streamline your operations, allows you to eliminate waste, allows you to attack the inefficiencies that sometimes actually large companies are not able to uh, manage. I mean, today, if I need a packet of milk, I mean, if I put very, very poorly to here in this group, and pardon me for that, you know, today I can rent, I can buy uh, that milk. I don't need a car to get to the airport. I can rent a car. Today, I don't need a deep expertise to have to be hired as an employee. I can get the guy for a gig capability for, you know, the few hours that I need. So how is it that I can uh, embrace cloud and the underlying SaaS platforms and capabilities that exist today, rather than sort of having to build my own hardware, software, you know, on-prem ecosystem that traditionally I've had to build and leverage that capability to drive automation and, and, and process optimization and a much more sharper decision-making, you know, which is backed by data are, are, are things that can create efficiency for us. Manpreet, sorry to interrupt you. Would you like to go full uh, screen on your slides? So right now it's not full screen. Okay, one second. This. Let me share it once again then. Just give me a quick second, sorry. This is not a slideshow, but it's... I don't have a lot of uh, details on the slides. If, th if this format this is works, perfect. This is perfect. This is fine. Let's okay. let's awesome. go with this. Sounds good. Sounds good. So let me just get to now. Uh, you know, maybe a few uh, examples of of making it come to life as to how small companies could leverage, uh, uh, you know, technology or digital to be able to create a competitive advantage. So let's just uh, you know pick up uh, any consumer company at this point in time. Now, as a consumer company. Uh, to be able to get yourself discovered, the point that I was trying to make, uh, you know, was one of the big costs. Customer acquisition cost was one of the big costs. Uh, marketing spends used to be very big costs. And some of the examples that I was talking about are cases that make it efficient for companies to get discovered. So whether you pick up, uh, you know, Nika as an example, Licious, the meat company as an example, you know, CureFit, you know, which sort of brought the whole fitness example to homes uh, on a digital environment. Are, are, are all cases of saying how you can, at a much smaller cost, be able to launch your brand, create a niche for your brand, and get your brand discovered, and hyper-tailor that to a customer for them to be able to experience what they were not getting as a hyper-tailored uh, uh, experience from large companies, is, is, is the piece that every consumer company wants to bring to the table. And then bringing in the whole DTH example is as relevant uh, as well. I mean, if you go back to... Uh, you know, uh, you know whether it's the big basket example in India or whether you take the Dollar Shave Club in the U.S. market. I mean, for these brands to have gone out and fought with Gillettes of the world was not easy. But they actually went back and challenged the tenets of how businesses like Gillette were 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 were, were playing out. I mean, Gillette would have offered a whole wide range of products. This company went back and said, "There's a ton of money that gets spent in building that product range and maintaining that product range." And the costs that get associated with sort of maintaining that large product range in the marketplace. So can I have a sharper product range and go big on that? Uh, you know, very similarly, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know the whole ad, the, the the packaging cost. You know, the glamorous packaging that would sort of attract the customer. In. They went back and said, how can I simplify that cost of packaging to make sure that I have that same product available at a much more sharper price point available in the market? So various cases in point for them to be able to have challenged that Gillette model created scale and for Unilever to them have acquired them at a billion dollar, you know, some years later, because they were able to build the market are, are things that come to life. You know, I want to pick up this next example of a tire company challenging itself and saying, you know, how can I be a services company? Now, you know, it's a competitive market as far well as tires are concerned. If I am a new age tire company and I want to go out and compete with Michelin's of the world, 
how can I do that? Uh, you know, how can I create a, you know, apples to bananas kind of a business model comparison rather than do more of what a large company was already doing and get beaten up in that journey because I will have limited sort of money resources at my disposable disposal to be able to compete with them. So here is a large tire company and I won't take name uh, uh, names around it, but I want to leave that idea back where they went back and challenged saying, how can I create a competitive advantage by not, uh, not selling a tire at that one time cost, but offering a tire as a service to a customer. So rather than the promise that a Michelin or a MRF would sort of make in the market and say that, you know, my tire will last for X number of kilometers and hence the landed cost per kilometer is small, or I offer a better safety because my tire is better made. Can I go back and say, you know, my tire is available at one and a half rupee per kilometer and I commit to a certain number of kilometers. And if I don't hold my commitment, you are saving your money and, and, and completely change the offering for the customer. And while you change the offering for the customer and created a competitive differentiation for yourself in the market, what you landed up doing in the process is started capturing underlying data of the driving of the customer and leverage that data as an insight back to the customer that creates loyalty and leveraging that data and now taking it to the insurance companies to going back and saying, you know what, I have the rider behavior, driver behavior data to be able for you to hyper tailor the insurance products back to a customer and actually optimize the cost basis, the driving patterns of the customer. And again, the underlying technology was sensors and IOTs uh, that had to be baked into the model. But you suddenly see a tire company becoming a service company, creating insurance revenues, you know, creating a better customer loyalty, being able to offer a, a sustained outcome to a company is something that just completely changes the game. And at some point in time, the large companies will have to now mend their ways to be able to get to this because the customers will like this a lot more is how competitive advantage gets created through some of these examples. You know, uh, you know, what is AI got to do with agriculture, right? I wanted to pick up an agriculture example because, uh, you know, there are no large corporates fighting this battle. It is predominantly a, uh, you know, a small format play in our country as far as agriculture is concerned. And how can we create that competitive advantage uh, in, 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 in agriculture? Now, various examples come into play. Now, if I look at an ideal farmer, farmer who's in the, who's in the, I mean, let, let me loosely call it a business of growing fruits, will typically need to do 15 trips to the farm, look at, you know, the, the, the fruits that are getting created and pluck just the right ones, which are ripe, and let the other ones stay until they get ripe because all fruits will not get ripe at the same time. Now, there is a certain amount of data points that a human mind is looking at, a farmer is looking out at when they are plucking those fruits. Can those data points get digitized and be put into a bot that can do this surveillance, you know, 20 times in a day and be able to pluck just the right fruit uh, when it is right. And again, create competitive advantage with a direct to home model where you're able to create ripe fruits getting to people's houses, which taste better, which are fine and minimize the waste that happens in this entire process. Uh, again, something that's waiting to be exploited at scale by any anybody at this point in time. You know, so much of food gets wasted in the supply chain that we today can in, have in the country. You know, optical sensors, uh, you know, imagery today can help you predict what is the level of ripeness of fruit and how long will it last before it gets wasted. And your ability to have a, a data-backed model with that imagery that can price the product differently basis the shelf life left can be a whole new business model that can disrupt the whole sort of fruit market or the vegetable market today in the country. Again, something that's waiting to get exploited by somebody in the SMB space. Technology is possible. Use cases are possible. Pilots are available. Microsoft and Amazons of the world, uh, you know, can, can, can get that enabled very quickly. But, you know, somebody has got to have the vision of kind of playing around and making this come to life. I mean, precision farming, we've all heard and seen is a reality that can create extra productivity and minimize the resources that go into using, uh, 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 growing the produce that we need to grow. This is the next one. You know, we keep hearing about generative AI and there's been so much of hype around generative AI. This is again a live story of a coffee company that wants to grow coffee sales in the country, in a country where coffee is not as native as tea. So uh, they, 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 their problem statement was, there are a lot of people don't fully understand coffee and are shy enough in engaging with us on the counters on saying, give me a difference between what a latte is and what a mochaccino is and what a cappuccino is. 
and that does not let them discover and indulge into coffee and get addicted to i mean get get into the details of coffee so they wanted a generative ai platform which could allow a consumer in a regional language to indulge with the brand and know their coffee better and get to the specific sharp coffee that they would like the most and again this is a generative ai bringing the whole hyper personalization in a regional vernacular language to the table for a customer to fall in love with that coffee brand versus some of the large format companies that are actually selling standardized coffee so that can get you the next level of growth in markets where coffee may not be fully penetrated again something while i've given a coffee example this is a thing that applies to practically so many more consumer businesses that we could sort of bring this to life uh, in you know uh, the next one is this whole you know blockchain animal that we keep talking about and i know it's been around for a while and small businesses think what is what am i going to do in blockchain i mean if we pick up uh, the icertis example which is now a multi billion dollar company i mean started as a startup some years back i mean the whole blockchain based contracting and bringing transparency and discipline around various contracts that happen in this large corporate world and driving accountability for the same is a space that they captured through a blockchain blockchain platform now i want to extend that logic to social media at this point in time i mean we are all going back and seeing how mark zuckerberg and facebook and you know all meta are being questioned or challenged on saying you know where is our data are you exploiting the data who has i mean there is a layer of uncomfort discomfort that we all have around the data that goes on to social media because it's eventually going out to a capitalist right there there is a potential of having a blockchain based social media platform where where the people who are generating content get rewarded for the advertising dollars that that social media platform brings to the table with no real one owner of that platform i mean if you bring that idea to life you have a possibility of millions of people flocking out of the public social media platforms and getting to a platform that is co-owned in a blockchain format which is more secure more private no one enterprise is exploiting that data and you're actually being rewarded for the content that is getting generated so if you generate the content and that leads to more eyeballs you actually get rewarded for it so you're like co-owner of that platform why would millions of people not want to get into this environment or again you know just i'm i'm you know i'm i'm generalizing some of these examples but are things that are waiting to be solved at scale uh, you know and can be activated by an smb format in fact will get activated in an smb format itself powered by technology now this is another uh, 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 you know live example and this is coming around the time in a in a pre covid world when car sales had actually completely come down and auto sector was struggling so they went back and said you know how is it that i can ensure that when a customer walks into a dealership i am able to convert as many customers and not let go a customer simply because i had a poor conversation as a sales rep with that customer you know because i'm i'm trying to buy a car cars an important purchase and depending on my experience in one dealership to the other dealership my brand could differ i mean i wanted to buy a fox wagon car but i landed up buying something else because one dealership gave me a better experience better answers better competitive insights than the others so what they actually eventually went down to uh, doing as a poc was to say can i i mean the first obvious answer was let's do some mystery shopping let's send hundreds of people as mystery buyers so we can compare you know what is it that my team is doing well what is it my team is not doing well but that's expensive that's unproductive and that has a bias of the people who are auditing this process so can we bring in a layer of technology that does this at scale at a much more cheaper price point so they went back and said every customer conversation that gets done can that get converted into text and can there be a layer of analytics done in terms of the conversation and the end sales and the correlation between the same and then the cctv cameras that are out there in the in in the dealership can that actually capture the imagery to figure out the emotion of the customer so draw a connect with the conversation that is happening the facial recognition the facial expressions of the customer and the eventual sales data in terms of lead to sale conversion and exploit that for the whole country and then start doing a comparison of saying what's working well what's not working well what's working well for a region versus not working well for another region so again while the example is for a particular dealership that wanted to make a difference in terms of their lead to conversion ratios but again can be exploited to a variety of uh, uh, business models all it needs is voice to text advanced analytics and uh, you know the imagery and the recognitions through cctv cameras so that's where uh, we are so uh, you know I, i'll just 
pause here for a quick reaction. I don't know. I, I know I'm getting at the bottom of the slot, but I just wanted to leave the room with some examples of how there is an opportunity in the market for people to reinvent how a particular product or a service gets consumed. Like the tire example I was talking about is an example of, you know, it's, it's a hundred year old business. People have been selling tires. How can I create a different game? So I have a unique vantage point and a niche business model that I create. So we have to challenge ourselves in bringing in technology, not just for efficiency. In fact, that's another point I wanted to make. A lot of people start off with a business case of digital and technology saying, kharcha kitna hoga aur kamai kitni hogi. I get it. But there are three waves in which technology needs to be thought through. The first wave is productivity, which is clearly here and now, which is obvious. You know, how much am I spending and how much am I saving? But then there is this next layer called performance. You know, am I creating a competitive advantage for myself? And the next layer is business model. Am I changing the business model and getting to a niche space that did not exist? And then is the last layer, which is called incubation, which is where you are at the horizon trying to look at options that will change the business model as we go along. Because in today's world, you can't have a business model and then stay static over it for the next decade because things are changing really fast. So, you know, just to wrap this up, I think I'm going to close with saying even the large companies PwC actually went around and spoke to CEOs, you know, around all the countries that we do business in more than 2,500 conversations. And I want to leave this question, uh, you know, this thinking in the room, more than 60% of the global CEOs came back and said that they don't feel secure about their business and the, and the, and the resilience of their business. They don't think in the current avatar and the business format in which they exist, they will be able to survive more than 10 years in where they are. And this I'm talking about is large corporates. So large corporates realize that they need to transform and change and get to a digital first business model to be able to be relevant to the new age consumer. And as they realize, they have a big struggle of changing a large elephant to become agile and nimble and challenge their 100 years of success with new ways of doing business. My, my humble ask to this group is to saying, as these large elephants learn to dance, you have an opportunity of creating a business model that is digital first. You have an opportunity of doing experiment that are much more low cost, which, which have much more determined entrepreneurs and promoters backing those ideas in terms of bringing them to life and then driving scale and growth like some of the, you know, our local heroes have done in the market. I mean, what, what Zomato did in the country was not heavy technology investment, right? It was a tech platform with a strong app and a strong ordering uh, and delivery experience. And there's a huge billion dollar business that you kind of created. That's the space I would encourage the group to kind of focus on and, and move ahead. I'll stop here, uh, uh, Gauri, for any questions from the group at this point in time. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for that, uh, Manpreet. It was exhaustive and at the same time also relatable. And I think that's the most important aspect of uh, the discussion today, which is uh, which is celebrating uh, MSMEs, their contribution, but at the same time, trying to create a business environment for them to embrace technology and encourage innovation. That's that's really what this uh, uh, session today is all about. And as we await uh, uh, questions uh, from uh, your talk, um, I want to use my uh, um, liberty as uh, and privilege as the moderator to ask the first two questions. Uh, one is that uh, India has the second largest MSMEs in the world after China, and everybody realizes the growth potential. The government is also announcing a slew of measures. But how do we get around the uh, inertia of uh, the or the reluctance of not climbing the tech ladder? Because you mentioned that the first uh, question that is asked is, what is my investment and what's going to be my return on that investment if I do start some tech upgrades? How do we get past that? See, I, I, I'm actually, I mean, I know that's an important question. And it's, uh, I mean, we talked in the market all the time and we still have promoters come back and ask a question. And especially if you're a successful small business, it becomes even more difficult because you seem to are, have been doing well. And the next generation comes in and says, oh, but my parents have been doing it so well and they're asking why should I be doing this? So, my, you know, I'm actually going back and drawing inspiration from what the 60% large format CEOs are saying. They will not exist. Some of the biggest companies and brands will not exist in more than 10 years 
if they don't change their business model. So in my mind, your right to exist is, it's not a choice. It's your right to exist is if you are nimble, if you have ample resources through, you know, whatever cloud ecosystem and a tech-led business model that is challenging the existing offering. Otherwise, why do you have a right to exist? Why should you be doing this business at all when a large company can do it quicker and cheaper and faster? So that's the, the pivotal point that I'm thinking. And when you are surrounded with technologists, I mean, if you don't understand technology and you have a CTO who's coming and giving you a proposal, or if you have a consultant coming to you and giving you a proposal, please challenge them in not asking what is the productivity. Ask them, can you tell me a new business model? Because the game today is not about doing things more efficiently. It's about saying, how can I create a new business model that did not exist? And we are all entrepreneurs at heart, right? If we understand a business model, if we understand how things can be delivered differently, then that question goes away because then it's not 1x leading to a 2x saving. Then it's 1x creating a whole new business that creates a 20x delta from a valuation standpoint. So that's a very important leap. And as I said, you have to embrace into technology. I mean, if your business does not have technology in, you don't have a right to exist today. It's no more a choice. I, I, I know this is more passion speaking than uh, spreadsheet speaking. But I think that's, I mean, it's a big part of a promoter's mindset to have that as a way of one of the tenants of running the business. If technology can do it, we have to make it happen. I know you mentioned you mentioned a whole host of sectors from agriculture to FMCG to uh, to a whole host of other sectors. And technology is sector agnostic, of course. But in your assessment, uh, who do you think or which do you think could be the sectors uh, that could be leading the change or becoming the early movers, so to say, and pulling up the rest of the lot as well as we talk about uh, tech uh, adoption? See, anything that is consumer, as I said, is... Is, is a giant leap ahead of the rest. And the reason for that is because our consumer today, you know, the, the I mean, we are a young country, right? The average mean age, average median age of, a, of this country is 27, 28 years. So you've got a young consumer and young consumer is digitally native because that's the environment they've grown in. I mean, they've grown up with a, with a mobile 5G phone on their hands, right? So they understand technology. They are comfortable navigating technology. Now you may be a 50 year old promoter, that does not think any dukan me aye bina mal nahi kharidoge. But unfortunately, that 18 year old finds that model better. They don't like to interact. Their social world is very, very different. So the consumer sector, as we call it, the, the brands, the product companies, the, the, the FMCG companies, is where you don't have a choice because the consumer is far more advanced and he wants an omnipresent uh, uh, business model to come into play. But again, the reality check, of course, however, is consumer may be a reality today. Like you can't be a brand today. I mean, tell me a company today that goes out and says, nahi, main to ki dukan pe mal bechta, main online nahi bech sakta. Aap nahi karoge, aapko funding nahi I mean, I know a successful business that is actually profitable, small business that says I've done this business reasonably well. It was built on the back of COVID uh, and, and a nice story, niche story, IITNs, but they have zero digital sales. They couldn't get funding. Because every investor came back and said, you may be profitable, but how do we get scale? We want 20x growth. You can't deliver 20x growth. So consumer is clearly the first one, the torchbearer. But again, my personal view, Gauri, is if you're a consumer business, it's tougher for you because you have no choice. But if you're in agriculture, you have a huge leeway because you know there's like, I mean, nobody out there who's using technology at scale. So you'll be able to create a much bigger leap quicker and faster is, is, is my take. At some point of time, I believe MSMEs would also be required to start sustainable practices. It's, I think, a matter of time. Uh, and uh, that regulatory landscape would probably uh, change in the next uh, two to three years. I, I see it probably uh, sooner, not later than that. Uh, do you think that could be another key factor pushing in tech adoption? Yeah, oh, absolutely, absolutely. And again, a very small example uh, of a, I can't name the company, it's a small setup. Uh, they are funded, they've got their first round of funding. They're in the business of tailoring. Now, guess what? In tailoring, they realize the cloth and the time of the tailor are the two big costs that they have, right? And they are now going back and saying the cutting of fabric that needs to get done basis measurements was a manual, Darji, Master Ji ka kaam hota tha, wo haath se kiya jata tha, and usme wastage hoti thi. Or usme consistency nahi hoti thi, usme quality nahi milti thi. That, can you imagine the fabric getting cut out is being done by AI today. 
and that actually creates a distinctive productive advantage for them because they are able to manage that cloth and create more output out of that same piece of cloth that a traditional guy was able to create. Now, when you minimize wastage, you are automatically moving towards the ESG agendas, the sustainability agendas. And that's going to happen more and more. I mean, the dollar shave club that I was talking about competing with Gillette, you know, by minimizing the packaging losses that were happening and by minimizing skews and creating niche segments, what you're trying to do is minimize waste. So I actually think the smaller businesses, the large companies have to do an effort to get to that sustainable way. I mean, they can afford it and hence they can spend the money. But small businesses have a right of creating a business model that is completely sustainable day one. And that can happen through digital because they are a digital native. They are tracking every aspect backed by technology. Like let's pick up Chai Point. I mean, Chai Point today is a complete tech company. I mean, they may be think selling chai, but you know, ki store me kya pick raha hai, kitna inventory chahiye. You know, having a whole CRM in place, having a supply chain tracking in place. I mean, all of that is perfectly managed. So what you're trying to do is minimize wastage, create efficiency, and create a customer delight at the end because you're never out of stock. So ESG will get baked into the business models when you are a tech-first, digital-first business. Ask yourself a question: Am I a digital native? Am I a digital-first business or not? And if you are not, then you will always be catching uh, your shadow. It's it's not going to be easy. Right. Uh, final question, and that's the editor in me asking, uh, which is that uh, on one end we talk about how technology can be a level playing field. Uh, to probably address, you know, issues related to gender, uh, uh, you know, gaps uh, where uh, women entrepreneurs are uh, severely disadvantaged. And at the other end, we're talking about technology probably taking away jobs. So um, it's it's a tough task to be a policymaker to try and address some of these challenges because uh, India also needs to take care of uh, the kind of employment generation um, that it has to. See, uh, I, I see two questions in that. Actually, the first one's much more tougher, the gender issue, because there is one, of course, uh, you know, women in tech is clearly a leap that the country needs to take and the regulator has to do whatever it takes for women to play with technology a lot more, not only for them to be comfortable, for, for but for a bigger problem, the whole bias that this other world has around saying, you know, women don't understand technology as much because there are always more engineers which are men than women. I mean, unfortunately, it's been... 50s and 60s and hundreds of years that this bias has been built in our minds, which needs to get changed. And there is no way to change it unless you take the bull by the horn. So it's a tough one to solve, but it's a very, very important one to solve because our desh ka GDP 5 trillion tak nahi jayega if we don't get women more and more active into entrepreneurial ways. And as I said, the right to entrepreneurship doesn't exist unless you are tech enabled. So that's a tough one. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I don't have a cookie uh, cutter answer for that one. But the second one uh, that you spoke of, which is around employability and technology taking away jobs, I'm I'm a big firm believer. Technology will only multiply and amplify jobs. It cannot take away job. You know, we have to. It is it is our lack of knowledge, lack of preparedness, lack of you know you know it, it's it's our own personal insecurity that makes us believe. I mean, pick up any examples, right? Did so matter to take away jobs? They amplify jobs. Because you have to have 100,000 riders now deliver food. That's a whole industry that never existed in the past. So very, very clearly, as digital comes in, as we take the digital leap, as the 2 trillion becomes a 5 trillion and 5 trillion becomes a 10 trillion, there are only going to be more and more jobs coming through. However, if you choose to sit in your cocoon and not reskill yourself, not upskill yourself, then unfortunately, you will might you might become redundant. But the wave will be so big that more often than not, you will kind of go with the wave and kind of skill yourself and hopefully be more employable. So the second one is clearly a, uh, a matter of time. Uh, it's, it's a positive one for sure. The first one, of course, a big challenge. On that positive note, uh, thank you so much, Manpreet, for uh, being part of this session and for that very exhaustive talk. Thank you, Gauri. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. And on that note, uh, I also now would like to welcome uh, Amit Sachdev, who's the COO of uh, M1 Exchange. Uh, he's a fintech entrepreneur and uh, strategy consultant, and he co-founded Cointribe, India's largest and most successful credit-based marketplace for MSMEs. Uh, and uh, he's also been with BCG prior to Cointribe. Uh, thank you so much, Amit, for joining us in this uh, session. 
And uh, Amit will be talking about uh, access to credit being one of the key areas uh, uh, that MSMEs need to focus on and priority needs to be given there. Uh, and that could really be a game changer for MSMEs in India, because as I said earlier as well, India has the second largest MSME cluster in the world, and access to credit continues to be a pain point for them. Addressing that could probably address uh, the issue of how to turn SMEs into large corporations. Amit, over to you now. Thank you. Thank you, Gauri, for such a lovely introduction. <clears throat> I'll share my screen. I hope that's visible to you. Yes. Yes. Fabulous. Uh, I must thank Manpreet for such a lovely prelude to this session. Uh, I couldn't have asked for something better. Uh, thanks, Manpreet. Uh, so, uh, Manpreet has already said the whole context, right? Uh, from a SMB or MSME perspective, multiple challenges which digital can help solve. Uh, one is obviously the credit access. Uh, how do you get access to loans? Uh, how do you get access to the whole supply chain financing? Uh, marketing and sales, how do you generate leads? How do you get more demand going for your products or services? Uh, what is SEO, what is SEM? Uh, can you use digital to improve your operational efficiency? Um, can you get the inventory management, the whole order management right, uh, just in time right by using the right systems, the right digital solutions? Uh, can you get the whole training agenda going with digital? Uh, multiple HRISs, which can help you do that. Um, and uh, people is one of the most critical resource. Getting the right people um, who can be groomed is critical to success. Uh, and last is uh, so much of money stuck in accounts receivables or getting the whole accounts payables in time is critical. So what multiple agendas, uh, but what we'll focus on in this session um, from a digital perspective is how do you get access to the right amount of credit at the right time using digital? Now, uh, before we get into how do we solve for it, let's look at the, the problem. Uh, the problem is huge by any yardstick. Uh, being to multiple MSME sessions, events for the last 20 years and every year, this gap, the total credit demand, uh, which is about almost uh, 800 billion to almost a trillion for MSMEs in the country, uh, of which only about $300 billion is met today. Uh, the gap today is about 500 to $600 billion, different studies, but uh, whether it is 500, 600 doesn't matter much. It's a huge problem to be solved. Every year, this problem keeps growing. Uh, 20 years back, this used to be about uh, 20, 30, 40 billion dollars, it's become almost 500 billion dollars. So huge problem, how do you solve becomes important. But before we go into how do we solve for this, uh, what is important to know is almost 70 to 80% of this gap is for solving the working capital, which is um, SMBs, uh, small businesses, and uh, the large corporate customers, uh, have a huge bargaining power. And hence, when do the large corporates pay to SMBs is, um, is obviously is a big question mark. Uh, uh, and hence, a lot of money is stuck in receivables. Um, there are payables to be made because for whatever manufacturing is done, um, there are a bunch of raw materials to be uh, procured, services to be had uh, from contractual labor, transporters, and so on. And hence, large part of working capital requirement which is not met. Now, why does this gap exist? Uh, let's spend some time on that. Four big problems. One is from a bank perspective, the whole small ticket lending uh, versus the large corporate lending, when a bank is giving loans of few hundred or thousand crores um, versus when somebody is giving loans of few lakh rupees, uh, the ticket size increases the operating cost, um, which can be as high as eight to 10% in case of uh, uh, lending to an MSME, uh, because the processes are extremely physical. Uh, while the digital has evolved, the bank processes for multiple reasons still remain fairly physical. The whole product design for SMBs continues to be a, 
a replica of what exists for a large corporate. And hence, um, uh, the moment you reduce a ticket size from few thousand crores to few lakhs, uh, it is no longer viable. From a bank perspective, the tech adoption has not uh, reached where it needs to be. Um, there's a lot of dependence on tech vendors to come and solve the problem. Um, and hence, it takes its own sweet time and cost. And last but not the least, um, there's a huge amount of information gap. Uh, given that there is little credibility uh, that most banks have uh, on the kind of financial statements which are published by the SMBs given to the banks, which is important for banks to figure out who is a healthy business, uh, who's a promoter running a healthy business, which can be funded and which should not be. So four big reasons why this gap exists. Let's see now uh, what can be potential solutions and how can SMBs benefit from those solutions. Trades is, uh, is one uh, digital exchange, uh, RBA regulated exchange, uh, which is solving this problem in a meaningful way, scalable way. Uh, so this is the mandate that RBA has given to Treads, which is to solve the challenge of delayed payments to MSME suppliers uh, by facilitating invoice discounting at a very competitive interest rates. So point to note is the interest rates are very, very competitive with a world-class convenient digital exchange model. So it's an exchange uh, which helps MSMEs unlock their receivables uh, with a multi-financer construct. So uh, three important parts, there are multiple financers and because of multiple financers uh, and they compete with each other on an auction basis to discount the invoices, the interest rates remain highly, highly competitive. Um, and all of this is enabled on a digital exchange, the likes of uh, a national stock exchange or a BSC um, that we all are very, very comfortable with. So this is the whole uh, 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 exchange where you have the MSME suppliers, the suppliers who would have supplied goods or services to either a large corporate or to a PSU or a government company, a government department. Now, from their standpoint, the benefits are A, once they get the invoice discounted, there is no recourse. It's completely clean. Um, the bank or the financial institution will not be able to um, chase them a follow up in case the buyer has not paid to the bank. So it remains absolutely clean for them once the bill has been discounted. The rates are highly competitive uh, because as you will find here, there are 52 banks uh, which are competing on the platform to discount the uh, invoices. The documentation is one time. While there are 52 banks on the exchange, um, and this is almost 95% of the banking industry, the whole documentation is uh, one time done purely with the exchange, uh, and the whole process of transaction is completely digital. Now, it is highly meaningful for financiers because they look at this to build the whole priority sector lending portfolio. Uh, and uh, just to uh, emphasize, because of uh, the RBI stipulation, the priority sector is a very important um, criteria, priority for the financiers. Um, in the absence of building the right amount of PSL, um, there's, a, there's a penalties and a uh, lot of complications in the life of banks. And hence, they are extremely keen to uh, participate on the exchange and fund these MSMEs. From this standpoint, the whole operational costs are minimal uh, because exchange takes care of the entire onboarding, the whole transaction, documentation, and so on. Again, uh, whether they finance one supplier or 20,000 suppliers, uh, their documentation is one time with the exchange. Similarly, for buyers as well, uh, it helps them uh, ensure that the vendors, the MSME suppliers remain, uh, the liquidity remains strong. Uh, they have the right amount of capital to do whatever value addition they have to do to buy the raw material, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and also it helps them reduce the whole procurement cost because the cost of financing for the SMEs comes uh, significantly below uh, the current cost of 16 to 18%, which they would otherwise have to incur when they're borrowing in open market. This is how trades have uh, <clears throat> performed. Uh, trades have been around for last six years now um, since RBI issued the licenses. 
about uh, 52,000 MSMEs uh, have been covered about um, across some 1,600 cities in the country. Uh, about 3,600 buyers have been covered. These are the large corporate buyers, the likes of Tata Motors, Tata Steel, Tata Power. Uh, and these MSMEs are uh, associated with these buyers. About uh, almost 60 financiers are on the trades platform now, and about 1,50,000 crores worth of bills have been discounted. This page shows the, uh, the breadth of the banks uh, and financial institutions who are present on trades, uh, almost 95% plus of the banking industry across the PSU banks, which includes the likes of State Bank of India, uh, Bank of India, PNB, Bank of Baroda, the private banks, the large ones being uh, the ICICI Bank, SDFC Bank, Kotak Bank uh, are on the platform. Uh, even the MNC banks, which includes the DBS, uh, uh, Barclays, Shinhan Bank, Stanchart, MUFG, uh, all are present on the platform. Uh, and because they compete for each invoice on an auction basis, um, and usually the bank which bids the lowest wins, there's a very, very healthy competition. And this is what uh, has led to enormous growth uh, in the transaction volumes on trends. As we'll find, uh, it's growing almost 150% CAGR um, uh, every year. This is a value addition, uh, which is done by trades um, because uh, there are multiple banks who compete for each invoice every day. Uh, the more the number of banks that keep cropping up, uh, the interest rates keep dropping. So very interestingly, if I have to look at, for example, these are uh, interest rates for different grades of companies, um, because depending on the kind of company whose bills are being discounted, um, the risk profile changes. And uh, if you have a triple rated company, the banks associate very, very low risk profile, and they offer uh, extremely low rate of interest. But if the buying company is not a AAA, but a triple B rated company, then the risk perceived is higher and the rate of interest is also um, or higher uh, correspondingly. So if you were to look at, for example, uh, companies uh, which are AAA rated, uh, the rate of interest fell from about 8.04% to as low as 3.96% uh, till March 22, when repo rates were falling. Uh, and uh, even after the increase of repo rates, it has uh, remained at about 6.37%. So now for a, uh, for a AAA rated company, their MSME suppliers, for them to be able to get liquidity at uh, such low rate of interest uh, has an has a excellent uh, way of solving the working capital problem. And it reduces the whole cost of doing business, uh, which benefits both the suppliers as well as the buyers. Uh, now, Treads, uh, while it's a digital platform exchange, uh, it can solve the MSMEs, both on the uh, receivable side of working capital and the procurement side. So if you look at, for example, the whole uh, receivable side, uh, they can get the receivables discounted from the corporate buyers. They can get the receivable discounted from the MSME buyers. Um, they can also get the whole procurement side sold, which means if they have SME sellers, they can also uh, discount the payables that they have to the SME seller um, and in turn pay to the financer on trades much later, uh, which means all of their working capital on procurement or sales side gets uh, covered pretty well uh, on the trades platform. What does not get covered though uh, on trades is in case they have any purchases done from a large corporate seller. Uh, because on trades, uh, what is extremely, what is important is the seller to be an SME. Uh, so that's the only thing which an MSME cannot get financed on trades today. Now, what is important is uh, uh, if you look at, for example, uh, a use case where there's an MSME who is selling to another MSME buyer. Now, that's something which most banks are not very comfortable with. Most banks are very comfortable with uh, dealing with a buyer who is a corporate, who is a 
uh, Tata Motors or Tata Power, Tata Steel, because those are well-recognized entities with well-published annual reports and financials. And banks uh, uh, are very comfortable taking a call on such big brands. The challenge is the moment you change that large corporate to an MSME, now that's something which most banks do not understand. Those risks are something which are absolutely new to banks uh, and those are unknown entities. And hence, how do you solve for uh, the risk so that banks can figure out uh, which MSME buyers are the right entities to deal with? They are running good quality, healthy businesses, growing well, profitable, uh, versus the ones which are not doing so well is extremely important. Now, the challenge for most banks is uh, they would like to figure it out by looking at the financials of the entity, which is how it is done physically, traditionally in most banks. Uh, the challenge is those financials don't have credibility. And hence, uh, how do you look at the credit profile of an MSME uh, without looking at financials becomes extremely important, uh, which is where, for example, trends have worked out uh, this digital engine, digital credit engine, um, so that using this by looking at data from multiple third-party sources like GSTN, bank statements, um, the transaction data, which is today available uh, on um, the platform because they, these SMEs have been dealing with um, uh, multiple buyers on trades and Sybil and so on, 30 plus of sources, uh, uh, this digital engine is able to provide a 360 degree credit profile of the SMEs, basis which the banks are able to take a well-informed calls uh, on uh, a well-doing healthy uh, SMEs. This is a, a critical part of uh, solving the entire credit problem for the SMEs. So summarize why uh, the whole discussion on solving the credit gap for SMBs, uh, the five benefits uh, for the SMBs and the corporate buyers. One is the whole interest rate scenario uh, on trades becomes remains highly competitive uh, given the presence of almost 55, 58, 60 odd banks uh, who compete at each invoice. Um, number two, the whole process is extremely digital. Uh, right from the invoice being generated to being put on the platform uh, to the whole bidding and settlement. Uh, this is all done uh, digitally, um, uh, including uh, on, a, on a web portal or on a mobile app, depending on the comfort of um, the SME. Um, and hence, this reduces the whole manual work um, for both the corporate buyer the whole process remains absolutely digital with um, complete control and transparency and the complete audit trail is also available on the platform. Uh, so in case someone wants to go back and look at uh, which all transactions have I done, um, on which date, who authorized that, uh, it is completely available on the platform. Third point is uh, ready access to uh, multiple financers, uh, almost 50 plus financers are on the platform uh, and uh, this can all be had using a one-time uh, documentation. Very importantly, fourth point, uh, this uh, on trades, the whole product remains off balance sheet for both the supplier uh, and the corporate. Uh, given that the moment discounting happens, uh, the for the vendor, it is completely clean, remains um, uh, means uh, without recourse to the vendor and it is not seen as a borrowing. And this is different from how traditionally um, it happens outside of the exchange where for the supplier to get his, his bills discounted from corporates, uh, the supplier usually had to become a borrower. Uh, he had to sign a facility agreement with the banks uh, which would make him a borrower and that would appear as a borrowing on the balance sheet. Uh, which is something which is not never desirable because this is supplier's own money uh, once he has supplied the required amount of goods of right quality uh, when once it is accepted by the corporate. Um, and hence, on trades, it is seen as factoring or assignment and remains off balance sheet. The last but not the least, uh, 
given the whole uh, discomfort at times people have with exchanges, uh, trades remains our RBI regulated entity. Uh, and this is what uh, gives a lot of comfort to all the participants, um, to the SMEs and the corporates that they're dealing with a fairly well-governed uh, entity where the processes are um, periodically, frequently audited um, and governed by the RBI. So this is uh, the last slide that I have, uh, Gauri. Uh, I'll be open to any more questions. Thank you for that, uh, Amit. It's uh, it's an overview of uh, the digital solutions that uh, MSMEs can uh, uh, take to, of course, address the issue that we talked about, specifically credit uh, access. Um, now, apart from this specific digital solution that we that you spoke at length about, I want to ask this: that um, what is what is it that will take uh, for penetration? of uh, digital lending or fintech solutions to increase amongst MSMEs? Because th that, that really is the kind of goal um, that we uh, would want for MSMEs, deeper penetration of fintech and digital solutions. Yeah, uh, a great question, Gauri. And I feel if I look at it, uh, what is uh, obstructing the whole growth of credit for um, digital solutions for SMEs? Uh, there are four costs. Uh, in a lending uh, construct, one uh, cost of uh, lending is the cost of customer acquisition. Uh, number two is the cost of credit, uh, where in case the NPs remain very high, it becomes a huge cost for the banks to deal with. And um, at some point, if it becomes too high, then they stop lending, number two. Uh, number three is the cost of funds. Uh, if the cost of funds is very high, which is what happens in case of microfinance, then the microfinance have to lend at 24%, 30%, and so on. And the fourth cost is the cost of operations, back-end operations. Now, if you look at it, if fintechs or digital lending try to solve for this problem, uh, given that fintechs are very small, they have a um, very small balance sheet, the cost of funds remains very high for them. So no matter how much of innovation fintechs will do, while they can uh, improve on the cost of customer acquisition, while they can improve on the whole cost of credit or delinquency, because they can have innovative credit models. They can also control the whole cost of operations uh, by having a very, very digital backend. The cost of funding where an SBI or an ICICI bank will have 50% CASA, which is at literally 0% cost. Uh, that's something which in FinTech can never compete with. And hence, the right way to solve for this problem is a partnership a partnership between the banks in the country and the fintechs where the banks bring in the low cost of funds and the rest of the customer acquisition, uh, the cost of credit, the cost of operations is completely controlled by the fintechs who come in. So that partnership to work well is, is um, to me, the right solution for digital lending to evolve in the country and grow. And final question, uh, as, as we... Uh wrap this session up um, Amit is the fact that as as MSMEs move towards greater formalization do you think access to credit will become a less of a pain point and probably more tech enabled solutions will come to address this crisis or this challenge yes uh, definitely Gauri uh, a wonderful point you made today Udyam uh, is becoming the amalgamation or the platform for formalization of SMEs uh, and uh, for us to, for example, provide any lending solution to SMBs, uh, Udyam registration is a mandatory uh, requirement or prerequisite. So the more formalization, more the Udyam uh, registration, which is growing phenomenally well. Uh, so today, for example, the number of Udyam uh, registered MSMEs is north of 1.5 crore. And look at it, a few years back, it was maybe a few lakhs. Uh, so it's grown really well, growing really well. Uh, but we have almost 65 million, 6.5 crore SMBs. Uh, so there's room to grow. Um, so I would request uh, any and every SMBs to um, get registered on them and uh, get the entire benefits that come along with it. Not just uh, lending, insurance, uh, uh, wealth uh, management, multiple avenues open up for SMBs.
All right, uh, Mr. Amit Sachdeva of uh, M1 Exchange uh, for this uh, session. Thank you so much for that uh, overview of the kind of facilities that uh, MSMEs can avail of to address their uh, challenges related to credit. Thank you so much, uh, Amit, for that. Thank you, Ari. And with that, I bring in uh, our last speaker, Mr. Sachin Kinagi of uh, Lenovo to uh, take us through the specific solutions that uh, Lenovo can provide to MSMEs uh, to address some of these uh, specific areas that the other two speakers highlighted in the session. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Gauri. Let me uh, begin by saying that both uh, Manpreet and Amit talked about uh, enabling technology as a very important aspect of growing down the digital path. So let me go ahead and share my screen and uh, we can start talking about uh, uh, what Lenovo brings to the table and how customers can effectively enable IT in their journey. So is my, are my slides uh, visible, uh, Gauri? And, uh, yes, yes, they are. Okay, all right, great. Um, so, dear customers, thank you very much for taking time out today. Um, a quick look at the agenda. Uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our vision and who Lenovo is. I'm sure most of you know Lenovo as a PC company, but we are more than a PC company today. And uh, then we'll get into a little bit uh, spiel on why Lenovo for SMB. How does the portfolio support some of the challenges that you have? and a customer speak where we'll have a customer talk to us about their journey on uh, working with Lenovo. Uh, to begin with, uh, the vision uh, and strategy is a smarter technology for all. Uh, we don't develop technology for the sake of technology, right? It's more about how this technology is human-centered. How can it help you drive more innovation and help you in your intelligent transformation? That's the essence behind the Lenovo Smarter Technology for All um, campaign. And the intention is to develop technology that helps you generate uh, more opportunities for yourselves and your organizations. Moving on, if you were to look at uh, who Lenovo is overall, uh, we start off by talking about where we're present. We're a global technology company present in more than 108 markets, uh, close to four devices per second are sold every. Uh, second, so essentially, uh, there's a large acceptance for te Lenovo technology by a lot, large number of customers. We have close to 17 R&D locations uh, with more than 75,000 employees across the globe. So clearly, we are present in almost all the markets that you and your customers may be doing business in. So if we were to look at uh, uh, where we are placed on the Forbes uh, uh, Fortune 500 uh, list today, we are now 171 on that list. Uh, and uh, we have grown to be a $70 billion organization from a revenue standpoint. Overall, there's been a huge amount of acceptance for Lenovo's technology and products, services, and solutions that we bring to the table. So if you look at uh, our uh, theme, we really li like to call ourselves the pocket to cloud company, which basically means right from your client devices to edge cloud and network solutions and intelligence around uh, uh, you know, generating uh, opportunities we have grown tremendously over the last 20 years. Uh, in IDG, which is our intelligent devices group, we are number one. In ISG, which is our infrastructure solutions group, we are number three. And our SSG, which is our solutions, uh, services and solutions group is contributing close to 9% of our overall business over the, over the last couple of years. As effectively, if you look at how our revenues are spread, it's not focused only on China. We have a majority of our revenue coming from Americas and then EMEA and then AP and then China. So we are truly global in that sense from a revenue perspective. And if you look at how we've grown uh, over the last few years, we have grown very inorganically. We started off in 2005 by acquiring the IBM ThinkPad brand. Uh, post that, we went on to acquire IBM, the System X portfolio and Motorola. Uh, from Google, and then eventually we now have a tie-up with Fujitsu and NetApp to deliver solutions, of a range of solutions. So clearly, when you look at it from a supply chain perspective, we are number eight on the uh, Gartner supply chain. And this is amongst all the other 
uh, organizations that deal with supply chain, not necessarily only IT. Among the 24, uh, number 24 on the most innovative companies and a global uh, uh, 100 recognition and the employees, best employees for diversity recognition. Truly building Lenovo into a global technology leader. So that's a little bit of who we are as Lenovo. And if you were to move on to understand our key strategy is around three verticals, smart IoT, smart infrastructure, and smart verticals. When we talk about smart IoT, we talk about anything and everything that every uh, device that generates data today. Uh, you heard Manpreet talk about uh, uh, getting to being intelligent in farming. Uh, you know, all of this will need IoT devices, IoT solutions that are generating that data that need to be captured somewhere, analyzed, and deliver intelligence. So smart IoT is uh, our is to make our devices more smarter so they can address more use cases. And data that is generated from all these connected devices then goes on to our smart infrastructure, which is essentially our infrastructure solutions group portfolio of servers, storage, uh, services, um, software as uh, defined services and uh, capabilities. And that allows you to capture that, build out that data center and essentially drive more intelligence out of that by applying big data and AI models from our smart verticals. So clearly the 3 S strategy is enabling customers from an end-to-end -end perspective, right from gathering the data to analyzing it, to driving business models out of it. Moving on, if we were to think about what are some of the challenges that we see from a SMB perspective? Clearly, uh, we see a lot of uh, uh, challenges that both Manpreet and Amit called out limited IT resources. Okay. Uh, just give me a second here. I don't know why. Uh, cybersecurity threats. Then you have legacy systems. Amit uh, did talk about legacy systems. So did Manpreet. Talent shortage and then cost. So effectively, if you look at all these challenges, be it budget, be it staff, be it lack of resources, be it the difficulty in maintaining the existing systems as well as enabling new technologies to be brought in to enable digitalization, there's a whole lot of things that uh, you will need from an IT standpoint, right? So we look at how the portfolio from Lenovo addresses some of these challenges and how you can use Lenovo to alleviate these pain points. Moving over, if you look at uh, the, the 3S strategy that we talked about, around SSG, which is our solutions and services group, uh, around edge cloud and network, you will see ISG, which is our infrastructure solutions group. And then if you look at intelligent devices group, which is IDG, which provides uh, each of the, uh, the devices that you use today, clearly all of these uh, uh, challenges that we talked about in terms of limited IT resources, talent shortage, cybersecurity threats, cost, all of these can be addressed through each of the business groups that Lenovo brings to the table. Let's look at it more from a portfolio standpoint. Let's talk about legacy systems. Now, how do you replace legacy systems with intelligent devices group portfolio? From a devices standpoint, we have smart devices, IoT, and scenario-based solutions. Take, for example, smart devices. Clearly, the ThinkPad brand is what you must have already heard of many times. Uh, delivering unprecedented uh, quality, reliability, and usability. We now have a variety of portfolio, including the ThinkBook, which is specifically meant to address the needs of SMB and uh, ThinkStation, which addresses requirements around more powerful uh, desktop workstation or mobile workstation capabilities, be it for graphics, be it for analytics. Uh, you have a portfolio that is allowing you to do a lot more. When you think about uh, devices from an IoT perspective, the OEM business is allowing customers to enable uh, digitalization by embedding, rebranding, or in integrating our devices into your solutions so that they are digitally enabled. So here, there are multiple advantages in terms of long life, in terms of making available uh, uh, products for a duration that is beyond the three-year life cycle. Uh, devices can go up to availability from a three to five so that they don't disrupt the digital solution that you have created for your customers. Then when you look at it from a scenario-based solutions, a combination of 
uh, hardware, software, and services. Uh, you typically have Think Reality, which is our uh, VR uh, solution, AR and VR solutions, Think Shield, more from a uh, in, uh, uh, end security solution. So that is a nutshell of what the Intelligent Devices Group portfolio offers. When you look at it from an infrastructure solutions group portfolio, three key verticals come out. We do have uh, cloud service providers, telco providers, and high performance computing. So for each of these verticals, we do have a capability that is uh, that allows you to de deploy end-to-end -end global capability, as well as highest performance and uh, be able to bring out the, uh, the best from computing. When you look at it from a cloud, big data, AI, we have strategic partnerships with uh, a variety of companies, right from IBM to SAP that allow you to enable some of these solutions, be it SAP on SAP HANA, we have uh, the best solution for SAP HANA available. Now, when you talk about manageability, you have Lenovo X Clarity, which allows you to sim uh, manage your devices, manage your technology more easily. So essentially, there's a whole lot of software portfolio that drives down the cost at the same time, enables you more effectively. So from a portfolio standpoint, you have Think Agile, which is software-defined infrastructure. You have Think System, which is our towers, rack, and den servers. And you have Think Edge, which is our edge computing portfolio. Moving on, if you were to look at the solutions and services group, we talked about how do I manage legacy devices? How do I enable uh, uh, more performance from my solutions? How do I deploy new solutions? How do I integrate the uh, disparate devices that I have. We have a variety of offerings from SSG that allows you to do that. Right from the support services in terms of premier support, where you get directly to a level two technician without having to go through the IVR, to configuration, deployment, and installation. The entire portfolio of managing your support can be handed over to Lenovo and you can focus on your core business. Moving over, if you look at managed services, if you want your entire IT to be managed, Lenovo can deliver, bring that to the table as well. So it's effectively, uh, the project and solution services can not only deliver a managed service environment, but essentially drive new implementations, de derive solution design and integration. So some of the examples uh, to call out that Manpreet uh, talked about, uh, right from uh, uh, agriculture to automobile industries, we are delivering a lot of projects and solution services with managed IT that allows customers to focus on their core businesses. Another key aspect of uh, uh, security that we talked about is cybersecurity. So how does Think Shield, which is our brand of security portfolio, offer security at its best? So when you look at security from a device or from a so, uh, IT environment perspective, you have three levels, the operating system to the cloud, everything below the operating system, and then the supply chain, right from where the uh, device is manufactured to delivered. The entire uh, uh, life cycle of IT is managed from a security standpoint. So there are various software solutions that we've tied up with that we uh, are now certified to sell, essentially implement, deploy, and configure, uh, which allows us to handle the OS to cloud. For example, from a data protection, military grade encryption perspective, we look at buffer zone, uh, 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 sorry, wind magic. And then if you were to look at threat hunting or incident response, then you would look at Sentinel-1. So there is Sentinel-1 that, that allows you to do that. And below, uh, below OS, you have Absolute as a software layer. And then from supply chain perspective, it is in the nose DNA to ensure that you have a transparent supply chain where secure device provisioning is done and there's an anti-tampering switch as well. So essentially, this ensures that the security threat that you can, may consider is taken care of. So moving over, another aspect of uh, the whole enabling IT effectively is around how do I manage my costs? We understand that with limited budgets, it's impossible to go and do a CapEx all the time. So we have introduced a new solution called Lenovo TrueScale which offers everything as a service, right? Uh, this enables you to innovate without limits and achieve your bold vision for the future. Clearly, you can do rapidly uh, provision global teams, 
uh, scale and flex your infrastructure capabilities, reliably effortlessly manage day-to-day -day IT operations, and free up, most importantly, free up capital by leveraging as a service model with no upfront cost. So it's a pay as use model that allows you to be more flexible. What does this offer? There are two key offerings here, device as a service uh, for digital workplace solutions, infrastructure as a service for infrastructure agility solutions. So it's a single supplier for deployment of hardware, software and services. It's pay for tech that is needed when you need it and offers you industry's best reliability and device uptime with the lowest failure rates amongst uh, IT vendors in, in the world. Um, flexible IT infrastructure allows you to seamlessly integrate with other uh, solutions such as devices to keep your infrastructure right sized and to react to changing requirements with a pay as you grow approach. So if you have a big billion day sale, you can enable more IT and then take off that IT when you don't need it anymore. So the device as a service and infrastructure as a service uh, fall under the brand Lenovo TrueScale, which is everything as a service. With that, I'd like to uh, uh, play a video on uh, uh, enabling IT for Grow, which is one of our leading customers in the industry space. I'd like to go ahead and play uh, the video now. At Grow, we provide our users a platform where they can explore various investment options like stocks, mutual funds, and invest without any hazards. Apart from mutual funds, uh, our other key verticals include fixed deposits, stocks, and gold. We have evaluated close to 1 billion USD. Uh, we are headquartered at Bangalore with around close to 13 million customers across India. When we started out, uh, we were looking for a technology partner who could help us scale and offer timely end-to-end -end support. We needed a service so that could help us to get back on track within seconds if we ran into a problem. It's much like a Formula 1 car, right? It's getting fixed at pit stop. That's where the Lenovo fits into the bill as a technology partner. As a startup, uh, it's a difficult for the IT team to run a business and simultaneously provide customer support to our employees to resolve the issues. Trying to balance the two both impact each engineer and developer, thereby you know, impacting our productivity. With its premium support, so Lenovo offers a dedicated customer support service that's quick and accessible via both WhatsApp and the name. Just we only need to drop WhatsApp message and then another execute will assign a tickets to get it solved as soon as possible. You immediately have a team that will help you to solve the problems that you are experiencing. We had to scale up our procurement of IT hardware devices with the different configurations as per the user requirements. Being the chief information security officer and head of IT, I also needed to ensure that this devices are deployed very secure. The amount of sensitive data you know, that we deal with the uh, mandates uh, that we consider security parameters like uh, EDR, XDR, antivirus and firewalls before choosing a solution. As we were quite satisfied with uh, Lenovo services, we also avoid a Sentinel-1 license from them to enhance our services and security, especially for the developer working on the financial products. We chose uh, Sentinel-1, not only uh, because it provides us antivirus and EDF solutions, but also you know, because it can be integrated with our environment and customized. We do not have to worry about any malicious files being uh, you know, integrated into the systems that might compromise uh, ours and our customers' data. Like most of the organizations, COVID-19 forces us to start working remotely from 2020. Consequently, we started revamping our IT infrastructure as we don't have the usual control of our IT environment from our homes. We have to ensure that our employees receive preload of the laptops that were still able to work in a secure environment irrespective of their location. Lena was able to procure those laptops despite the crunch in the global supply chain and helped us continue to scale up. 
for us nano was never just another vendor they were part of our organization where their team helped us to automate our scripting and deploy the solutions across the systems through continuous governance calls nano provides services and solutions uh, that take care of the devices uh, throughout their life cycles given how its life cycle solutions have helped us stay agile till now we know we can bank on them for any solving issues without any doubts nano help enable us to stick to our mantra of giving our best to our customers while ensuring that our employees are satisfied with the cross it infrastructure and security controls okay thank you so that that was a testimonial uh, from grow which is one of our uh, customers so in summary what i'd like to call out is uh, customers acceptance has and uh, innovation that lenovo brings to the table and the capabilities that lenovo can in, uh, drive from a smarter technology for all has enabled us to be a number one in the pc global market with uh, various awards for many of our products and solutions and uh, uh, help us position strongly in different markets across the, the regions uh with that i'd like to hand it back to gauri uh for any questions thank you for that uh, uh, so sachin kenagi with that uh, we uh, come to an end of this uh, session thank you so much for uh, that uh, detailed uh, overview of uh, lenovo's uh, offerings and thank you for uh, thank you to all the audience who joined in this uh, masterclass session thank you thank you very much